Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The part of God's Word we will consider together this morning is taken from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. You see, the kingdom of heaven is like a man going on a journey. He called his servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, according to, or, and to another two talents, and to still another one talent, each according to his own ability. Then he went on his journey. The servant who had received the five talents immediately put them to work and gained five more talents. In the same way, the servant who had received the two talents gained two more. But the servant who had received one talent went away, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. The servant who had received the five talents came and brought five more talents. He said, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. The servant who had received the two talents came and said, Master, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. This is the word of our Lord. Please be seated. Dear Christian friends, when we consider the universe in which we live, when we consider our place in it, when we consider what it all means, people can get funny about that. I mean, people are funny about their stuff. You know, even people who recognize this isn't all my stuff get a little put out when someone comes and takes some of their stuff. Because we like to see it as mine. This is my stuff. Don't you be touching my stuff. This is my stuff because God gave it to me and you can't have it. And sometimes we don't put it like that depending on what age we're in. Sometimes some, it'll sound like, Mom gave it to me and you can't have it. She gave me the whole cake. <laughs> and sometimes we think, well, this is my money. God gave it to me, and I decide how I am going to use it. This is my time, and I'm going to decide what I want to do with it. Funny thing is, we're willing to take advice about some really, really important things. And sometimes we're unwilling to take advice about things that aren't nearly as important. For example, I can preach a sermon on how to treat your family and how to raise your kids. And they, people love that. And if I preach a sermon about how to use your money, people say, oh, there he goes again. All the church wants is my money. Why don't they say all the church wants is my kids? <laughs> so when we think about whose stuff it really is, consider a couple of things. First, who made it? Second, who gets to keep it? Third, who's the only one that can use it flawlessly? God made everything. We know that. And we don't get to take anything with us except that which God chooses to send with us. Our soul at first, on Judgment Day, we get to bring our body. By faith and by grace, we get to bring our family and our friends. But the stuff we don't want anybody to tell us how to use, that we leave here. So when we think about what God has given us, and how we should use it. Really, the only thing that matters is knowing the master. Because we too are his. 
And so Jesus says this. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a man going on a journey. He called his servants and entrusted his possessions to them. Now think about that. He called his servants and entrusted his possessions to them. And when you think about the word entrusted, how we use that, when we think about things that are precious to us, if you go out and you, and you entrust your children to the babysitter, do they now belong to the babysitter? Well, temporarily, she gets to make the choices, and I probably shouldn't be sexist like that and use, our, use the politically correct plural. They get to make the choices. They get to decide. But did they make them? Do they get to keep them? Well, no. You just entrusted them to the babysitter for a little while. And Jesus tells us the kingdom of heaven is like that. It's like a man going on a journey. He entrusted his possessions to his servants. And that's what God has done for us. He's entrusted his possessions to us. They're still his, but we get to make the decisions about them. We get to use them the way we choose. I want you to think about how do we see our possessions. Do we consider them 97.5 of my stuff belongs to me and 2.5% belongs to God? Now you might wonder where those numbers come from. Those numbers come from the synod average of what people offer in their offerings to God. They, on average, the Wells people give 2.5% of their income to God. And so do we believe that 97.5% of it belongs to me? Or do we believe 90% belongs to me and 10% belongs to God? Because after all, that's what God commanded in the Old Testament. He said that we should tithe. And in the Old Testament, it was a law. So was he saying that 10% of everything that he gives to us belongs to him and the other 90% belongs to us? Well, you can probably tell because you're logical people that there's another one coming up. And I think you already know what it says because you already know what God says. Does nothing really belong to us and all of it really belong to God? So if you look at how Jesus continues his parable, he says this. He says, to one he gave five talents, to another two talents, and to still another one talent, each according to his own ability, and then he went on his journey. Now a talent is an interesting amount of money. Because when we consider a talent, a talent of gold was 75 pounds of gold. So each one of them received at least about a million dollars. So when you think about how valuable your talents are, the things that God has put into your control, and that can be what we refer to as talents, the things that we happen to be good at, the things that we enjoy, the gifts that God has given us, how much is that worth? or when we consider the resources God has given to us, they are not insignificant. And so it's not like he gave a little to one and a medium size to another, and to Papa Bear, he gave the big one. He gave them all vast amounts of resources. And the servant who had received five talents immediately put them to work and gained five more talents. In the same way, the servant who had received the two talents gained two more. And we might be impressed with these guys, the way that we're generally impressed with people who are successful in our culture. But remember what God said to the Israelites just before they went into the promised land? He said, you're about to cross this river and you're going to plant fields and you're going to build houses and you're going to start businesses and I'm going to bless you. And you're going to be tempted to think 
that my work and the skill of my hands has produced this wealth for me. He said, in that day, remember that it's the Lord your God who gives you the ability and provides the success to produce wealth. So when we look at these guys and we think, man, that guy with five talents, he gained five more. How good is he? Wrong question, isn't it? How good is God? And the one who had two talents, God blessed him too. Because everything that we are, everything we have is under the blessing of God. And the blessing of God is by grace. What He has chosen to give to us, what He has chosen to put into our hands is His call. Our job is are we going to use them? Do you remember the third guy? Third guy, the servant who had received one talent, he only got a million, by the way, he went away, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. God tells us the only way that you can really blow using his gifts is not to use them. Because sometimes we're a little nervous to use them because we don't want to use them wrong. For example, when he gives us a voice and he tells us, tell people what you know about Jesus, we're a little nervous about that because some people don't want to hear it. And I don't want to make it worse. And what if I say the wrong thing? And maybe somebody else should do it. Because that's not my thing. That makes me so uncomfortable. I think we should leave that to the people who are comfortable with it. Is that what God said? He said, only you who are comfortable with this, go and make disciples. Or did he say, go, make disciples. And he said, you're going to do that two ways. One, you're going to baptize. Two, you're going to teach. And whether you decide that you're going to teach in footsteps, whether you're called to teach in the school, whether you decide you're going to teach at home, whether you decide you're going to teach just by talking to people, go and teach. Bring it up. Because most people do not know the things of God. Most people do not know what you know about the Bible, about forgiveness, about grace, about eternal life. Just tell them what you know. The only way you can really blow it is to bury it, is not to use it. Because when we do use God's gifts, when we decide how I'm going to use my time, how I'm going to use my words, how I'm going to use my money, God blesses that. So look at your budget. How are you using God's gifts? And what comes first? Because when we think about God gives me some money, what comes first? The temptation is, I got bills to pay. And when all the bills are paid, then we'll see what I can do with the rest. Is that what God says? One of the most disbelieved promises in Scripture is in Matthew chapter 6. Seek first God's kingdom and His righteousness and God will take care of the rest of that stuff. Put God first. Of course, we know that's the very first commandment. We know He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. He says, set aside at the, on the first day of the week something for the Lord's work and then live on the rest. 
But Satan is in your ear saying, can you really trust God to take care of you? Those bills are piling up. You don't have much. Is God really being fair by saying, put him first? Or should you just bury it? Take care of number one first. Is God really going to keep his promise? When he says to give generously, when he says to put him first, is he going to keep that promise? Can you trust him? Of course, here in church, we recognize that for the lie that it is. But sometimes he sounds pretty convincing. Will I really have enough left? Which really means, can I really trust God? Or should I serve myself and let God take care of himself? Because the man's coming back. After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. It's another way of saying judgment day is coming. And we consider how is God going to settle accounts with us. The grace of God is such that when we stand before the throne of God, we do not have to depend on how well we have served. We do not have to depend on the good things that we have done or we would all be roasting in hell. When we stand before God, we stand in the righteousness that Jesus won for us with his life and with his death. We stand in his grace. We stand in his promises. We're going home because Jesus died for us and rose again. Our sins are forgiven. Isn't it amazing how Satan can use even that to say, be selfish. Because if I'm going home by grace, then I might as well put me first here. Because I'm going to go home anyway. In fact, he had me convinced a long, long time ago. I used to think the luckiest guy on the planet would be the person who was a rank unbeliever and could do anything he wanted and about five seconds before he died, came to faith and went to heaven. What's wrong with that picture? Do you see the lie I fell for? I actually believed that sin would make people happy. Tells you what kind of kid I was. But isn't that the essence of sin? That if you are selfish, if you are lazy, if you just put you first, then life will be good. If you can gather and gain and store and bury enough stuff, then you'll be okay. And then God says, that's not going to work. And we don't have to look around very far to see that God is right. And I don't know that any of us would be really surprised to find out that God is right. That people who gather and store, people who are greedy and, and, and ruthless, people who sin and sin and sin are not happy. It doesn't work. Sin does not keep its promises. God does. So when he says, put me first, he'll keep the promise when he says, I will take care of everything else for you. It doesn't surprise us that when he brought, when he brought these men in front of him, that the, man, the men who actually put their talents to work gained more. That's the blessing of God. The question before us today, do we trust God? Do we trust Him to know what's best for our lives? Do we trust Him to show us the path? 
The way to heaven, already ours. Paid in full by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Do we trust God to guide us through this life? Or are we going to listen to Satan instead? Because trusting God takes faith. It's not easy. Trusting God means that you're not going to lean on your own understanding. Because God's math isn't like our math. God's math very often says, all right, if you give to God first, and now you're going to be $300 short for the next two weeks, my understanding says I can't afford to give to God right now. And that's where he says, don't trust your understanding. Try it. Remember what he said that in Malachi? Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Test me in this. Try me once. So many of God's promises, people have no idea whether they're true or not because they don't try it. Fourth commandment, the only commandment that has a promise. Children, if you honor your parents, you will be happy. Most children have no idea if that's true or not. God tells us, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. I'll take care of the rest. Most people have no idea if that's true or not. So God says, trust him. Because when we know the master, when we know his grace, when we know his power, when we know his love, and we know we can trust him, we know he's smarter than we are. We know his math works better than ours. We know his promises are good. And that the path that he puts before us is the best one. It's rarely the easiest one. But it's always the best one. So we trust God. And by faith, we remember that everything he puts into our hands, he has entrusted to us to use for his glory, for him to bless, for his kingdom, for us to put him first. Because he's already showed us he loved us. He's already come, he's already died, he's already risen again, he's already returned, and he's promised us he's coming again. And by his grace, we are his. And by His grace, we're going home. And by His grace, we can serve Him well. Amen. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.